Good morning to you. Good morning. Yes, we're, I think we're even quieter this Sunday than we were last Sunday. Yes, yes, it must be the holiday period. Folk, I know, are, are away. It's a, it's a chance for people to have a rest over this um, spring season, although it's not been very spring-like. You should have received a copy of the intubation sheet as you came into the church, and I commend that to you. Um, particularly do remember our elders and others who will be helping us on Tuesday evening to draw together a job description for this post of a ministry assistant to come amongst us in the future. And so do remember our leaders as they spend time on that on Tuesday evening. That will be the bulk of the meeting, the various gatherings for fellowship, the fact that the church continues to be open and encourage you in the midst of perhaps sometimes all that's going on in our world and our lives to take time to be quiet and to reflect together and use the church for that opportunity during the week. And the rest of the intimations are there. And then inside you will have seen a little leaflet which um, is concerning an opportunity to perhaps run either a Christianity Explored course. Christianity Explored is a course that probably many of us are familiar with and looks at some of the stories of Mark's gospel and helps us to explore who Jesus is, why he came, what he said, what that means in terms of his death and resurrection. But there's also another couple of courses that the same people who produced Christianity Explored have also produced Life Explored, um, the, what's the best gift that God could give you? And in a world where many people are searching for meaning and purpose and hope, this is a course which looks at the nature of God. How in a confusing life can we have stability and security when everything else perhaps is shaken round about us? So we need to get to know who this God is. And by looking at various parts of the Bible, it assures us that this is a God who is trustworthy, who's generous, who's liberating, who's fulfilling, who's life-giving, and who comes to give us life in all its fullness. And then Hope Explored. Again, what's the best future you could ever imagine? People longing for hope, especially in a world of great confusion and war and strife. And this is a relatively shorter course, just looking at three aspects, hope, peace, and purpose, drawn from Luke's gospel. Uh, the opportunity is, I uh, would be interested in perhaps leading such a course, but I'm not going to do it if there are going to be people interested in taking part. So just think about that. Think about perhaps people you might be able to invite to come along. That's the whole point, especially of, of these types of courses. And so I'm going to just raise this before you over the next few weeks, and um, I wait for feedback from yourselves. No point in running things if people aren't going to be able to use them for good Let's quieten our hearts in God's presence. Let's pray together. And as we come together this morning, I'm sure many of us have heard of the ongoing situation with Iran having targeted Israel during the night and the whole concern there. And also perhaps we've picked up in the news feeds that the situation in Ukraine on the Eastern Front is not very good for Ukraine. The, they are losing territory there, being worn down. Just in the radio service this morning, the preacher at that mentioned that there's 30 wars going on in the world at the present time, including one that we don't hear much about, a civil war going on in Sudan, where people are tottering on the brink of starvation and the collapse of a country. And so as we come before you this morning, we are very conscious of our world and all of its need. And also the needs of those more known to us, broken lives, insecurity, uncertainty, all the things that bring about fear and anxiety into our life because things aren't the way they were meant to be. And we know, Lord Jesus, that you grieve over this world. You grieve over the state of this world. And you have entered into this world. You have come amongst us, full of grace and truth. And so our prayer is that this morning, as we meet with you, Lord Jesus, the one in whom grace and truth is embodied. That even in the confusion of our times and the perplexities of our circumstances, we might hear you. 
your voice, our name being called, your presence being experienced, your reality made known. And so, Lord Jesus, stand among us in your risen power. And may this time of worship be a hallowed hour. I lift my eyes to you, the psalmist says, to you who sits enthroned in heaven. As the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a slave look to the hand of our mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he shows us his mercy. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us. And hear us as we sum up all our prayers now in the words of that family prayer that you have given us to say. Saying, Our Father, and in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. So let us worship God. We thank Janice for leading us in our praise this morning. And we're going to begin by singing together an older song, an older chorus together, but one I'm sure that most of us who are familiar coming to church will know. Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord. And we'll stand to sing. Thou art worthy to receive glory and power at the Father's right hand. For thou hast redeemed us, hast ransomed and cleaned us by thy blood, setting us free. And I hear somebody echoing my voice, so you obviously know it. And white robes arrayed us, kings and priests made us, and we are reigning in thee. Well, we'll try and endeavor to sing the second verse, will we? Right, I'll give you a wee lead, and some of us will know it anyway. So it's, thou art worthy, O Lamb, thou art worthy to receive glory and power at the Father's right hand. And I'll give you a wee lead as we sing that through together. Thanks, Janice. Sorry. Redeemed 
robes are red. White robes are red as kings and priests made us, and we He's our creator, but also our redeemer. And our next song picks up on that. The one who has held the oceans in his hands is also the one who felt the nails upon his hands. Who has held the oceans in his hands? And so, Lord, in the confusion of our times, in the crises of our lives, in our need of your mercy, in the frailty of what it is to be human, we need such a great and big God. And so we gather and we join with your church throughout our world in this your day. Bring to you our worship, for you are the only creator. And in Jesus Christ have ransomed and bought a people for yourself. And so may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. And the people of God said, Amen. Please be seated. Jessica, over to yourself. Hey, guys, do you want to come out the front with me? Levi, Amy, are you coming? Well done. (laughs) 
I have got some things with me this morning and I would like to see if you could guess what they have in common. Oh. Yes, you know what they are, but you don't know what they've got in common. Nice try. Yeah, they're all red. Oh, well, maybe. So I have okay. matches. Light one. No, I won't light one just now. Um, chocolate chip cookies. The chocolate chip part matters, okay? So chocolate chip cookies. Crisps or potato chips, if that helps. Coca-Cola. And antibiotics. This is amoxicillin, but pretend it represents the penicillin. Okay, so penicillin. Okay, well now we know one of them. No, so what do you think all of these have in common? So all these ones have what I have in common are because that bit's red and that's all red, but I have no idea what that one is. Right, so f you think some of them are red? Okay. Oh, Levi, what do you think? I think they're red. He, he, he said he thinks he loves them. He thinks he loves crisps, yep. But that's not what they have in common. Jack? You can find them all in a kitchen. You can, do you know, that's a brilliant guess. Jack said you can find them all in a kitchen. Yeah. Which is true. Yeah, matches you would find in a kitchen. And a lot of people have medicine. their medicine cabinet either in their kitchen or their bathroom. We well, this is we, we have them on, t on top of the fridge so nobody can reach them, don't we? Our medicine, I yes. So... Would you like me to tell you? All of these things were made or invented by a mistake. A mistake? Yeah, all of them. It was a mistake. It was a complete accident. Yeah. So, crisps, for example. In a restaurant, there was someone who sent their potatoes back because they weren't very happy with their roast potatoes. They thought they were too soggy. So, the chef took exception to this and thought, I'll show them. So to get back at the customer, he chopped his potato so, so, so thin and cooked it and it was hard and crispy and he thought, ha ha, there you go, we'll complain now. But actually, the customer loved, loved it, loved how the potatoes were made and that's where crisps or potato chips came from. Cookies, cookies in general have been around for a long time, yeah. but they, used, they didn't used to have chocolate chips in them. A lady was baking in her kitchen and she knocked the chocolate chips in and her family loved it. So people continued to do it. So all of these things were made by total accident. They were mistakes. I can't remember how every single one was, but I can well, look it up that, after. <laughs> that, that used to be... I imagine they were trying to make another drink, Jack, but, but, and ended up with Coca-Cola. But, but Coca-Cola used to actually be a drug. It had cocaine in it. It did, yes, that's true, but we'll not go into that just now. <laughs> so, they might know, I think they put lots of sugar in. I can't remember them all, but see after today. Well, we'll look them all up together. I did have a big list. Yeah, we'll make another service. We'll make another service, I don't know about that. But these were all made by mistake, but then they were used for good, weren't they? Because all of these things, we like them, or they're very, very useful. And do you know, God does that with people. Even people that made mistakes can be used for good things. Well, yes, darling. Well, aren't these made from? They're matches. Right, so God uses people. Right, listening just now, okay? So God uses people that have made mistakes. So who we're going to think about today is Peter. Can anyone remember who Peter is? Pan. Peter Pan. Not Peter Pan. <laughs> so Peter, one of Jesus' disciples. There was, there was a big mistake that Peter made. Can anyone remember the mistake? He grew up. He grew up. That, I guess that was a mistake, but that wasn't the mistake this Peter made. This Peter is the Peter that denied Jesus three times. Do you remember? And Jesus said at the Last Supper, you will deny me three times. And Peter was like, no way. Because Peter was a very close follower of Jesus. And Peter was someone that would kind of rush in to Jesus' defense and said, no way, you won't die, I'll, I'll be right there with you. But when it came down to it, Peter denied Jesus three times. When asked if he was one of Jesus' disciples, he said, no, no, that's not me, three times. But do you know, 
That wasn't the end for Peter. Peter made a mistake, but like these items, he had another chance. So after Jesus was risen, the third time he appeared to his disciples, Peter noticed him on the beach when they were all fishing and he jumps in the water and swims right over to see Jesus. And Jesus asks him questions. And again, it's three times. And Peter says, uh, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter, of course, Lord, you know I love you. Then feeds my sheep. Ask, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? And he tells him again to go and feed his sheep. Why do you think Jesus asked him three times? Um, because he denied him three times. Because he denied him three times. That would help him remember, oh, this is me. I'm getting another chance here. Wouldn't it? And do you know, Peter did go on to feed, feed my sheep because what Jesus meant was, go and tell people about me. Be a shepherd, be a leader. And Peter, even though he messed up, he went on to be one of the first leaders of the Christian church. And people really listened to him. So just like all of these items were made by mistake and were used for good, Pe Jesus did that with Peter. And he can do that with us too. So no matter how much we mess up, we can, God can still use us for his glory. So the song we're going to sing now is My Lighthouse. And I want you to think about the first couple of lines where it says, in my wrestling and in my doubt, in my failures, you won't walk out. So when we mess up and make these mistakes, God doesn't give up on us. We can have another chance like these things. Okay, well, we'll go back to our grown-ups and sing the song. Thank you, guys. I'm sure we can have some of them later, yes.
hear my granddaughter saying there, oh, I'm going to get a biscuit. And I thought, well, you're going to get one. We're not going to get one. There we are. Then we'll want to flee through to um, the park. Kids, tots, or teens, you're more than welcome. Um, you might even get a biscuit. Some of you may remember, you may not, um, when we started this short series in John's Gospel, the one that Jessica, I nearly said Karen there, there you are, you see, <laughs> the one that Jessica so ably led us through there, that I used a little illustration of my own journey with my health and how it was important, I was told, that my core muscles get strengthened so that I would be able to recover from my operation and deal with some of the consequences of that. And so I had gone back swimming. I have to say, I haven't been there for the last two weeks. Um, much as I love children, it's funny how when there's no longer your own, sometimes, and so going to the pool during the school holidays was not my idea of relaxation. I have to confess that. And so I shall return um, this week because one needs to do it. In fact, without going into too many details, I see even in the fortnight of not doing the swimming, let's just say a wee consequence. We'll not go into the details. You can ask me personally afterwards. <laughs> and, and so it's important that our core being is strengthened when we face trauma, physical trauma, surgical trauma. But it's also important, and we mentioned that right at the very beginning, that when we face other kinds of trauma in our life, a trauma of a failure in life, of being let down in life, some chaotic situation or some situation perhaps even at work or in a relationship or wherever else where we're not just physically affected but emotionally and spiritually affected. I went to visit a dear friend of mine who I've known since school. I've known him for well over 50 years now, 55 years anyway. And he's a guy who's not had a family, he's been married, but not had a family. He's been blessed with good health. He has a condition to do with his eye, but I mean, he's had that since he was a teenager, so he's kind of used to that. And, and he quite likes to be kind of quite fit and look quite the part. And last Sunday, he came down the stairs from his house in Hamilton, where he lives, and he said, oh, do you not think my, to his wife, my, my, my legs are a wee bit swollen? And she kind of looked at it, and she was a practice manager, so she's medically aware of things. And she said, oh, I think you've gone and twisted it or done something. It wasn't too bad. However, by Monday morning, it was inflamed and very swollen and hard. And so they phoned to try and get an appointment for the doctor. They didn't get any appointment with the doctor. <laughs> or there was a, a phone consultation. We all know what that's like. It's not our practice, hasten to add, but nonetheless. Um, and it was getting worse. He was actually supposed to be going in the afternoon to speak at a ladies' meeting with math, because he's a volunteer with math. He's been in this church. A good friend of mine, you'll know me, Nielsen. And, and he couldn't go because by that, by the lunchtime, it was really... So his wife said, well, that's it. We're just going to go up to the accident emergency. He went up to the accident emergency. He had waited, obviously, a wee while, but he did get through relatively quickly. They examined the leg. They finally they did a, a CT scan, the leg, and then they gave him one for the whole body. But the one in the leg showed that he had a clot, uh, a thrombosis in his leg. He said, have you been on holiday? Have you gone anywhere? No, no, they were going to Canada in four weeks' time, but they hadn't been away. So he got sent home with pills, anticoagulant things. However, he was hardly in the door before the phone rang. You'll need to come back. The scan showed up. Not only do you have a clot in your leg, but you have one in each lung, which is very serious. And I went to see him on Friday. Here's somebody, and Ian would be the first person to say that. I don't know whether you're listening online. You probably listen to Hamilton Baptist where he's a member, but nonetheless. And he's somebody who's been quite kind of, you know. And when I saw him on Friday, it wasn't just the physical side of it. He was going to get home. But I could see, and he'd be the first to tell you that emotionally and spiritually, not put into a place of doubt, but he actually said, oh, you know, God, you know, God is, because I could have had taken a heart attack or stroke because he's had this for a while. And he's deeply, deeply shaken up. So when these things happen in life, and suddenly, the things we think are, are settled and secured, our health, our prosperity, whatever else, when suddenly that's thrown up into the air, where do we find our security, our stability? The disciples had been through a great trauma. They had seen the one that they had followed nailed to the cross. And John, reflecting on that, 
towards the end of his life and reflecting, and as I've said before, reflecting with his particular insight into the events of not just Easter, but the life of Jesus. He's the one who in the gospel, in his own gospel, speaks of the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, somebody who was intimately and emotionally close to Jesus. As he reflects on this, he feels the trauma. No doubt as he's recalling this story, he remembers what it was like to stand with the women as he saw his Lord, the one that he loved, crucified, and heard the words of Jesus saying to him and saying to Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary, this is now your son. He's going to look after you and care for you. And John, this is now to be like your mom, and you're to take her in and look after her. He would remember all of that, and he would feel in the being, as core of the being, the emotions that that released. Sure, many of us can look back to events that happened many years ago. Things perhaps sometimes we'd rather forget, but then something happens and it all comes to the surface again and we feel deeply the emotion and the pain and the turmoil of that situation. Well, John can testify to that. That's why at the very end of John chapter 21, and if you want to turn in your Bibles now, please do so. At the very end of the section we're looking at today, we're told, and this is not John only, this is the church of the time testifying. We read in verse 24 of John 21, this is the disciple, talking about John, who testifies to these things, who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. True. This is others who know John at the end of his life saying, look, what John's writing about, the reality, the issues, the power, the dynamic, and yes, the, the calamities and the victory of the story of Jesus, we know it's true because we see that lived out in the life of John. And when he speaks of these things, he speaks with that personal passion that only somebody who would be an eyewitness to an event could speak like. This is not some second-handed or third-handed story. John's story, the story of all the gospel writers, or the testimony of those who contribute towards the gospel. Peter, right, speaking to Mark, for instance. All of that bears that personal passion that what they saw, and what they experienced, and what they heard was true. And John wants to remind us the only answer, ultimately, to having your life turned upside down and having the world that we know turned upside down, and who knows, our world could easily be turned upside down relatively quickly and relatively soon. When that happens, what ultimately really matters is what, who we are and what we believe in and what we know is true deep inside us in the core of our being. So let's read how John wants us to know that as we pick up. We'll pick up in verse 30 of John chapter 20. We referred to this last week, but we'll pick up from there. After the story of the resurrection and the first Easter Sunday and then the following week when Thomas comes to face, we write in verse 30 of chapter 20, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Afterwards, Jesus appeared against to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he'd taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. 
And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask them, who are you? The you was the Lord. And Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And this is the word of the Lord. We give thanks to God. What do you do when things blow up round about us? Even within our inner being, or perhaps even practically, we retreat back. We retreat within ourselves, perhaps, to happier times and happier memories. We may even physically or geographically go back to somewhere that's important to us. I, I can testify to that. As you know, back in August, I had cause for very right and good pastoral reasons to take one of our missionary partners to the Keswick Convention in Bucky, which was held up on the northeast coast of Scotland. And it was an important time. I actually saw Fabry last week. He, he, he asked me to convey his love and his prayers and his appreciation of your support. He's been through trauma, but that's another story for another time. But for me, at a time when I was aware that, yes, I was heading towards some crisis in my health, I, I went along to Cullen, which is just along the coast from Bucky, where I spent many happy holidays as a boy. My parents went on holiday. My mum had gone to Cullen on holiday since before the war. And, and for me, that was quite a, a cathartic time, to, to stand on the rocks that I used to stand on as a wee boy and watch the waves come in. And the rocks were there, and no doubt after... 50 years, they're a wee bit smaller than they were 50 years ago, but as far as I was concerned, they still stood there. And as I stood there and looked round and heard the kids playing and all the rest of it, and spent some time in that area, I have to say, I mean, even now I can, I can feel the emotion of it, and that's why I'm trying to share the story with you. There are times and places that speak to us of lasting things. A rock in the midst of a storm. And we go back to that. And we find comfort and hope and assurance as we don't know what the future has in store for us. And of course, it was only a week or so later when the consultant told me that I had prostate cancer. The disciples returned to Galilee. They're actually doing what Jesus commanded them to do. But I'm not aware, I don't necessarily think they consciously thought, right, we'll do what Jesus has said, let's go to Galilee. <laughs> They went back. Now, not all of them came from Galilee. That's important to note that. But the lead disciples, Peter <laughs> and others, went back. They went back to what they were used to. They went back to fishing. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. And so they go back. And Peter and others take charge. And they go back to fishing. And they were inshore fishermen. We know that because remember the story of Jesus taking them across, where well, they went across the other side of the Sea of Galilee to, to the other shore. And remember, the storm blows up and they're sore afraid, as the authorized version puts it, because they were out of their depth in many ways. Not only were they out of their depth in terms of the lake, they're out of depth of experience. They were inshore fishermen. They didn't usually venture away out to the other side. Because Jesus takes them there for ministry purposes on the other side, but also to remember and to remind them and reveal to him, he's the one who in the midst of the storm says, peace, be still. Here we could do a double act, couldn't we? I'm glad you know these stories. They're so vital. So here they are, back to where they're familiar, back to doing what they've known, and they go and they do it, and what happens? They don't catch anything. Is nothing going to work? We've gone back to what we're used to, and the fish won't play. They won't turn up. They won't provide. And perhaps even as they did that, they may have heard these words of Jesus. I am the vine, John 15 and verse 5. And you are the branches if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, 
you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, the disciples called not just from fishing, but from other trades and professions, but nonetheless, the disciples who are called are called to leave behind their nets and whatever they were used to, wherever they felt comfortable, they were called to leave that behind and go on a journey, a journey of discovery as to who God is and what God was doing in Jesus. And that was going to take them out of their depths. That was going to take them far away from where they felt secure. But it's a journey that Jesus has gone before and left leads us on. And even here, in the midst of the dawning morning and the dawning realization that the fishermen can no longer fish, Jesus is there. Early in the morning, we're told, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. This happens, and we have reference to this in the gospel records, perhaps for a number of reasons. One, that Jesus is the same but different. Let's be honest, you know, we just can't suddenly pop up somewhere, you know. He could appear and disappear. And so he's the same as the resurrection body. It's the same but different. But also perhaps more profoundly, early in the morning, the last thing they're actually looking for is to see the Lord. And yet he has this amazing way of turning up when we least expect him and appearing in the most unusual and challenging circumstances. And the words here, and as you know, I've got enough trouble speaking the King's English. I can actually say the King's English now because we've got a king. But you know what I mean? I have enough trouble speaking the King's English without overly referring to the Greek. But nonetheless, it's quite important here, the word that Jesus uses when he calls out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? That's just not some casual comment. That's actually a, a word of intimacy. The word that actually signifies a personal, intimate, father-child relationship. John himself picks up on that later on. Let me just read to you some words where this same word for friends is used in his letter, First John, which we'll touch upon just briefly as we end our wee journey through John next Sunday. But these words from First John 2 and verse 12, I am writing to you, friends, but actually it's dear children because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write unto you fathers, because you know him who's from the beginning. I am writing to you young men, because you've overcome the evil one. I write to you dear children, because you know the father. I write to you fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And he goes on in that tone. That's the word that's been used here. It's a word of intimate connection. They might have gone away to Galilee. They might feel far away from the Lord. They might not expect to see him, but Jesus knows them and has called them to be his children. Little children, haven't you any fish? No, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. You can almost imagine the dynamics and the disciples, at least Peter and company, saying, well, let's be honest, we fished here all. We know how to fish. We're fishing on the right side of the boat. I mean, you know, the other side of the boat. That's where the fish are. Not here, but there. But they weren't there, so he fishes there. They're so desperate, we'll do anything. Does sometimes that happen to us? We're put to a situation where, frankly, we have no one else to turn to. And out of our comfort zone, we hear that voice that calls us to do this or that and the other, to turn to Jesus. And even against our common sense of what everybody else might say, we go fishing on the other side. And we're told they hold in a net, which was bursting because of the large number of fish. And in the midst of all of that, in the midst of that situation, as the sun rises, as the day dawns, and as the voice of the command of Jesus comes over the waters, and John, the disciple, recognizes not just the voice, not just the body, but the fruit of that voice. I am the vine. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. Well, here is a testament to that fruit. All these fish, as John sees that and testifies to that, but saying, it's the Lord, it's Jesus. Then we have Peter jumping into the water. He'd have been naked. They fished naked. Obviously, they to keep their clothes dry. He jumps in, takes his outer garment, probably holds it above his hand, 
as he wades ashore and then quickly puts it on so he's at least decent. That's Peter for you. I always this picture, this big hairy guy, you know, you know, breathes on, leaves the rest of the guys behind to clear up the mess, to bring it ashore. But he, he who heard his voice deny Jesus, his Lord, three times, he who were told in the gospel records went out and went bitterly because of his failure, he longs to be right with Jesus. Naked, I to the cross cling. No point trying to pretend. Peter knows his need and comes ashore. And perhaps even this morning, you may be listening to this online. And one of the reasons you're not at church is because you fail big time. You can't bear the shame or the the consequences of all of that, and yet you're listening because deep down you know that you need Jesus. And he's put you in a position where you're well out of your comfort zone and where there's all sorts of things that have fallen through your hands and the things you thought you could do have failed and the person you used to be is no longer valid and you think, where can I turn to now? And Jesus is saying, well, come ashore. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you peace. We're going to pause there and sing together. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. And the music, I don't know about anybody else, but I think the music, you can always hear the waves and the wind blowing the waves and the Sea of Galilee as we hear the music to this old but much loved hymn. <laughs>
Jesus, the rock of ages, the great I am, the true vine who tells us that without him, we can do nothing. And he does all things well. 153 large fish. And that's not just a coincidence. So near to the shore, the large fish should have been here, there. So he's the sovereign God who orders even the fish to be where perhaps normally they wouldn't be. Why? In order to provide for the disciples? Yes. To feed them, to provide them for their families? Yes. But also to reveal who this Jesus is who says, come and have breakfast. And they take bread. Or he takes bread and breaks and passes round. And there's an analogy there to the Last Supper and everything else. Time is moving on. We could spend time on that. But let's move on. When they'd finished, verse 15, when they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. And when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Jessica has already very helpfully reminded us through that very helpful old age talk, taking mistakes and yet things fruitful coming from them. That's the amazing thing, not just about crisp or Coca-Cola or anything else. That's the amazing thing about the grace of God. Interesting, what one of the kids said, what oh, was a big mistake? Peter wished it maybe hadn't grown up. Oh, maybe we don't regret growing up, but I'm sure as we grow up, We'll have our regrets. And for some, again, here or listening online or whatever, these regrets aren't just things that can easily be brushed away. Or if we did, we'd fall over the lump they made in the carpet because they're major failures. Relationships broken. A life damaged. Promises thrown away. And whatever those regrets may be, large or small, things we might regard as indifferent or whatever, God knows them all. He knows the way he takes us. He knows who we are, our rising up and our lying down. That knowledge that is so wonderful for us. That knowledge that God has of us. You, what Peter was like, even before he even called Peter to come and follow him. He knows what you and I are like, and yet he still calls us warts and all to follow. And he takes, and psychologists and others would, would quite helpfully tell us that, that he does quite deliberately three times. Peter, the bold boy, he said, oh, everybody else might run away, you know, but I'll never let you down. And three times he denies them. And then he hears the cock crows and Jesus quite literally takes them back through. There is a reality and a need for Peter not to brush this under the carpet. Not to pretend that everything's fine. They're all sitting together having fish and Jesus is there and it's back to the way it used to be. This is a you day, literally, but it's also a you beginning for Peter and the rest of the disciples. The Savior died, but he rose again. That's a cathartic point in history and a cathartic point in our lives. Nothing is ever the same again. And Peter, to enter into that, to that life in all its fullness, that Jesus spoke about as he knows the truth, the truth that will lead him and the rest of God's people to found the church and the fruit of which is us and countless millions gathering like this today. All of that will begin as Simon Peter recognizes and comes to terms with his failure and God's forgiveness. 
and it's true for all of us. Our failure, our sin, and God's gracious forgiveness. And again, the Greek scholars will tell us that there's a use of a different word here. John, of course, is the great disciple of love. And I don't mean that in any immoral way. But he remembers the commands of Jesus. This is my command that you love one another as I have loved you. Someone shows their love for their friends by sacrificially helping them. I show my love for you by giving my life for you. I lay down my life. For I am the good shepherd, and they will hear my voice, and they will come and follow me. And Mary in that garden tomb, and Peter now, and John hear the voice of Jesus, and they can do nothing but respond to him. They're drawn irresistibly, even if that means they have to face some very serious challenges about who they are and what they have done. And Jesus leads Peter through all of this. And the very last, when he says, Simon, John, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because they are actually, again, we're told that the word that Jesus uses for love there in the Greek is the same word. Up to now, he's been using a different word, a slightly more sort of agape type love, whereas Peter's been using the love for brotherly love, filial love. And so Jesus is asking him, do you love me in that sacrificial way? Do you love me, really? And if, that, if you do, then you will care for my lambs, you will feed my sheep. But ultimately, Jesus is also saying, do you love me as a brother? And that's why Peter's so hurt. He's maybe let Jesus down, but he loves him. And for the one who sticks closer than any brother, as the book of Proverbs tells us, he's inviting you and me to simply say, Lord, I do. You know all things. You know that I love you. You know that I've messed up. You know that I let you down. You know that I'm far from perfect. You know my personality type and all the rest of it. All that challenge is lying before you just as much as I'm, you know, being naked and not ashamed. But through it all, and in it all, I do love you more than anything else. I love you, Lord. Words are easy. But the consequences of us using those words in relationships will, will have serious consequences. Marriage, family, loyalty, commitment, answering the phone, going somewhere where perhaps we wouldn't really want to go to, but we go because our friend wants us to go and he's on his own. And for Jesus, it meant for Peter, but for all of us to take up our cross and to come and to follow him. The way of service, the way of sacrifice, the way of not putting our own desires first, but the desires of the Lord and then of the Lord's people first. That's costly. Being a follower of Jesus isn't easy. Or is it for those who really want the easy life or the safe option? For Peter, it meant ultimately, and people would reflect on this, John's writing, as I say, at the end of his life, and John knows what happened to Peter, crucified upside down in Rome at the time of the persecutions caused by Emperor Nero. It's going to be costly. It's going to mean his life. But it's a life lived with Jesus who has conquered the grave, dealt with sin, and is alive. And Peter hears that call. And so do I, and so do you. And the terms for the great apostle are actually in many ways no different from the terms for you and me, mere ordinary folk at sitting in this kirk on a Sunday morning. The terms are simply this. Well, if you do, you follow me. And you let me take charge. You remember that without me you can do nothing. You seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, dependent and realizing that God will provide everything else that we need. You take up your cross and you follow. Thank God he is merciful to us and does not deal as our sins deserve. If he had, Peter would not have had a hope. 
but he did. And we too can have that hope. As in honesty and in humility, we tell him that we love him. You are merciful to me. You are merciful to me. Every day my disobedience grieves your loving heart. But then redeeming love breaks through and causes me to worship you, Redeemer, Savior, Healer, and Friend. Renew my ways. Fill me with love that never ends. We'll stand to sing. And so Peter discovered, as indeed the rest of the disciples did, the truth of what the Old Testament, their Bible said, although your sins be as scarlet, I will cleanse you and make you as white as snow. As far as the east is from the west, so far will I remove your transgressions from you. And therefore John, as we'll touch upon next Sunday in those opening verses in his letter, says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us from our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the Jesus who calls us to follow him. As we draw to a close, let's pick up in verse 20. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive to return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is this to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Poor Peter, isn't it? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus commends him. 
upon you, Peter, will I build my church. The very next minute, Peter says, but there's no way you're going to Jerusalem to get killed. And what does Jesus say? Get thee behind me, Satan. He has this tremendous encounter with Jesus. He's led through that painful experience, and he hears his own voice saying, you know, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And he hears the commission of Jesus to go and to feed the sheep and everything else, and the call to follow, and the dust has hardly settled. And if we were wanting to write the story, really, we would have ended there, or at least write a slightly different ending. And lo and behold, the words are hardly out in the mouth. The fish is hardly eaten, the valley sat down, I've gone on to do whatever they do, and Peter starts looking about himself and sees John. Don't want to read too much into the story, but sometimes I think there's a bit of a love-hate relationship there. Maybe not hate. John, the one that Jesus loved, the one that was closest to him, the one who was there with his mother on Calvary's Mount. And what about him? <laughs> you know? What about him? What's going to happen to him? I'd like to know that, Lord. Um, what's, good, you know, what's the story? How easy it is, isn't it, friends? The writer of the Hebrews tells us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the shame and suffering of the cross. Consider him... And we hear that, we say, that's right, we're sitting in church this morning, and I trust by, <laughs> that we are, by the Holy Spirit, considering Jesus, and our eyes are drawn to him, and I'm sure that is the case, and yet we go out the door, and very easily we start, oh, well, what about this, or what about that, what about him, what about her, what about what I'm hearing in the news, what about what's going on in the world, but what about the situation with my family, whatever it may be, very, very easily, thank God he remembers that we are but trust does not deal with us as our sins deserve, but comes alongside, but he comes alongside with a voice of authority. This is a Jesus who stood before Pilate and told Pilate the only authority he had was the authority that came from God that put him in the position to put Jesus on trial. Pilate, you're not the boss. He is, and I'm here representing him and actually him incarnate. So don't forget, Peter, don't forget Pilate don't forget me, don't forget you, that actually I'm in control. Whatever's happening in Israel and Iraq, whatever calamities may befall in our family circumstances, whatever illnesses may come our way, ultimately he is in control. What is that to you, Peter? You can almost hear. There's a, there's a, there's a, a right sternness here. If I want him to remain alive until I do return, what is that to you? Forget about that. You, you must follow me. And each of us stands and will stand at the judgment seat. And we can't point to this person or that person or them down the road. Oh, but I remember we each have to give an account of how we lived our life and followed our Lord. And John ends by that statement, even if the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Now, in one sense, that's a bit hyperbole, perhaps. But in another sense, John ends as he begins. Remember the very beginning of the gospel, very familiar words. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which is his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. And I can read those verses and we can hear those words and yet not 
any amount. There's no limit to the amount of books that could be written trying to explain that which is beyond, actually, comprehension. The God who's made all things. We, we nowadays, perhaps even more so than in those days, they looked up and saw the stars. Nowadays, they can explain much of what happened in the vastness of the universe. It's mind-boggling, isn't it? And it's meant to be like that. The heavens are meant to declare the glory of God. We're meant to look up in the night sky, and we're meant to say, how great thou art. We're meant to fall before our Creator and recognize His might and His majesty and His power and His dominion and His authority. We are made as creation to worship the Lord our God and to have no other God. And so no amount of human knowledge, no great intellect, can take that which is beyond understanding and say, I've got it. Apart from the one who is the word that spoke and brought everything into being and comes to us and says, I reveal it. I reveal it. And so like Thomas we fall at his feet and we say, my Lord and my God. And recognize that in the perplexities of life, in the disasters that befall us, in the chaos that seems to overwhelm us, perhaps God's sovereign hand is at work. Not that all things are good, far from it, but all things work together for good with those who love God. Oh, love again. Remember what Peter said to Jesus, I love you. Those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And perhaps it's just because I'm getting a bit older. But life teaches us that, doesn't it? Those of us who are older. He knows the way he takes he knows the way he leads. And even through the difficult times, he's got fresh things to teach us of how great he is. It's all there. It's up. It's around us. And by the Spirit, to those who know him, it lives within us. And how's that possible? Because of Jesus. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The one who said, Behold, I was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore. So hear his voice. Come ashore. Follow him. Receive his mercy. Know his forgiveness. Open your mind up to his wisdom, for his wisdom incarnate as well as everything else. And allow him to lead you through this life. For the Jesus whom we know comes to tell us, I have given you life in all its fullness. I am the light of life. And he who knows me and walks with me and dwells in me will never walk in darkness. For I am the one who fulfills what John records for us, the God who so loved the world gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have life everlasting. And you know, friends, in the middle of this decade in a world increasingly gone mad, we need to know the life of Jesus or in truth. We have nothing. I love you, Lord, and I lift up my voice. Let's sing. We'll remain seated as we sing this quiet worship song together. We'll sing it through twice, once accompanied by Janice, and then perhaps a second time we'll sing it unaccompanied.
hear your word to us this morning. And I trust that by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we have met with you, Lord Jesus. One sense for many of us sitting here in a familiar place, but for others who are amongst us this morning, perhaps a very strange place. And some of the things we do might appear rather strange, and yet as we've come, as we've been drawn to come here this morning, we too have heard your voice. We too have heard our name being called. And our eyes, the eyes of our hearts have been opened and we've seen Jesus. The crucified and risen Lord. And we recognize that call to come and follow is deeply personal. It's for all of us, yes, but it's deeply personal. And Lord, we come knowing what that might mean and perhaps not knowing what that means for us in our lives, what that might mean for our work, for our relationships, for our careers, for the use of our time and our talents and our money. But we come with all of that, our little life in a little bundle, but like Peter's undergarments probably wrapped up and over his shoulder. And we bring them to you now, Jesus. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. And our prayer is, Lord Jesus, that where you are lifted up in gatherings and in congregations up and down our land, where you are lifted up, you will continue to fulfill that promise that you gave, that John records for us, that when you are lifted up, you will draw men and women and young people to yourself. And so we ask that you would guide us and help us to know who it is that we might help to get to know Jesus, whether it be through some course that we might run as a church, whether it be through personal conversation, whether it be through bringing someone along here on a Sunday or at other times. But Lord, use us as your disciples, as those who say that we will follow you and that we love you. Take our lives and use us for those kingdom purposes. We used to bring our offering forward at this time of the service. Maybe we don't do that now, but nonetheless, metaphorically, we bring the offering of our lives laid down in adoration before you. And so take my time, take my talents, take my conversations, take my the relationships that I have, the people that I know, the circles that I move in, and own them and use them for your kingdom purpose, we pray so that you might increase, Lord Jesus, that we might decrease, and that all the glory and the honor and the dominion and the might be given unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If there is things that have come up this morning that we would like to talk about more after the service, then please do feel free to speak to folks round about. You'll know people in the congregation that you have a relationship with. You can chat. We're blessed as a congregation with having a, I was going to, what is a number of ministers? We have one, two, four ministers of, sitting here today. I don't know what you call four ministers, apart from a worthy gathering of brothers. But um, there are people here and others who can help you if you have questions and would like to consider more. This is an old hymn, and I've mentioned many years ago why I quite like it. It's one of the old redemption ones. As you know, many of you know anyway, my background, my dad worked for the Glasgow City Mission. And I still remember, when I ever sang this hymn, I remember Co-Hill Street. It was in at the Gallagate, and it was an old mission hall. And let's just say the atmosphere inside wasn't as fresh as perhaps it might have been. Some of the dear saints, a plat from the, the stewed tea that was being cooked in the wee kitchen. Nowadays, health and safety would have a fit. Um, you know, but nonetheless, you got their tea in their bun. And I was there along with my mum because my dad was doing something and we were there. I was quite a young lad. And yet, as I saw some of these old women and old men who had hard lives, remember these people had been brought up during the war, during depression, lived in social housing that hadn't been renovated in the 1980s the way it was. They'd had hard, hard lives. And yet, as they sang this old hymn, their face lit up. Despite the griminess, perhaps, of their coats, their face lit up. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. 
rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. Now, this isn't a Cohill Street, and I take it most of us are reasonably clean and in our right minds, but let's sing this to the praise and the glory of God. Janice.
we neither know the day or the hour when he might come or we might be called. Let's say the words of the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Please be seated.